Part 2 The Swamp Chapter 22 Same Tide 1965 Nineteen years old, legs longer, eyes larger and seemingly blacker, Caius sat on Point Beach, watching sand crabs bury themselves backward into the wash. Suddenly, from the south, she heard voices and jumped to her feet. The group of kids, now young adults, she'd watched occasionally through the years, ambled towards her, tossing a football, running and kicking the surf. Anxious they would see her, she loped to the trees, sand tearing from her heels, and hid behind the broad trunk of an oak tree. Knowing how odd this made her, not much has changed, she thought, them laughing, me holding up like a sand crab. A wild thing ashamed of her own freakish ways. Tall skinny blonde, ponytail freckle face, always wears pearls and round chubby cheeks, romped the beach, tangled in laughs and hugs. On her rare trips to the village, she heard their slurs. Yeah, the marsh girl gets her clothes from coloured people has to trade muscles for grits. Yet after all these years, they were still a group of friends. That was something. Silly looking on the outside, yes, but as May Bell had said several times, they were a sure troop. You need some girlfriends, hun, cause they're forever. Without a vow, a clutch of women's the most tender, most tough place on earth. Kaya found herself laughing softly with them as they kicked salt water on one another. Then, shrieking, they rushed as one into the, into the deeper surf. Kaya's smile faded when they pulled themselves out of the water and into their traditional group hug. Their squeals made Kaya's silence even louder. Their togetherness tugged at her loneliness, but she knew being labelled as marsh trash kept her behind the oak tree. Her eyes shifted to the tallest guy. Wearing khaki shorts and no shirt, he threw the football. Kyle watched the cords of muscles bunching on his back, his tanned shoulders. She knew he was Chase Andrews. And over the years, ever since he nearly ran her over on his bicycle, she'd seen him with these friends on the beach, walking into the diner for milkshakes, or at Jumpin's buying gas. Now, as the group came closer... She watched only him, and when another tossed the ball, he ran to catch it and came close to her tree, his bare feet digging in the hot sand. As he raised his arm to throw, he happened to glance back and caught Kaya's eyes. After passing the ball, without giving any sign to the others, he turned and held her gaze. His hair was black, like hers, but his eyes were pale blue, his face strong, striking, a shadow smile formed on his lips. Then he walked back to the others, shoulders relaxed, sure. But he had noticed her, had held her eyes. Her breath froze as heat flowed through her. She tracked them, mostly him, down the shore, her mind thinking one way, her desire the other. Her body watched Chase Andrews, not her heart. The next day she returned, same tide, different time, but no one was there, just noisy sandpipers and wave-riding sand crabs. She tried to force herself to avoid the beach and stick to the marsh, searching for bird nests and feathers, stay safe, feeding grits to the gulls. Life had made her an expert at mashing feelings into a storable size but loneliness has a compass of its own. And she went back to the beach to look for him the next day. And the next. Late one afternoon, after watching for Chase Andrews, Kaya walks from her shack and lies back on a, silver, on a sliver of beach, slick from the last wave. She stretches her arms over her head, brushing them against the wet sand, and extends her legs, toes pointed. Eyes closed, she rolls slowly toward the sea. Her hips and arms leave slight indentations in the glistening sand, brightening and then dimming as she moves. 
Rolling nearer the waves, she senses the ocean's roar through the length of her body and feels the question, when will the sea touch me? Where will it touch me first? The foamy surge rushes the shore, reaching toward her. Tingling with expectancy, she breathes deep. Turns more and more slowly. With each revolution, just before her face sweeps the sand, she lifts her head gently and takes in the sun salt smell. I am close, very close. It is coming. When will I feel it? A fever builds, the sand wetter beneath her, the rumble of surf louder. Even slower by inches she moves, waiting for the touch. Soon, soon, almost feeling it before it comes. She wants to open her eyes to peek, to see how much longer, but she resists, squinting her lids even tighter, the sky bright behind them, giving no hints. Suddenly she shrieks as the power rushes beneath her, fondles her thighs between her legs, flows along her back, swirling under her head, pulling her hair in inky strands. She rolls faster into the deepening wave, against streaming shells and ocean bits, the water embracing her. Pushing against the sea's strong body, she is grasped, held, not alone. Kaya sits up and opens her eyes to the ocean foaming around her in the soft white patterns, always changing. Since Chase had glanced at her on the beach, she'd already gone to Jumpin's Wharf twice in one week, not admitting to herself that she hoped to see Chase there. Being noticed by someone had lit a social cord, and now she asked Jumpin, How's Maybelle go going anyway? Are any of your grandkids home? Like the old days. Jumpin noticed the change, knew better than to comment. Yes, sirree, got four with us right now. House full with giggles, and I don't know what all. But a few mornings later, when Kaya motored to the wharf, Jumpin was nowhere to be seen. Brown pelicans, hunched up on posts, eyed her as though they were minding the shop. Kaya smiled at them. A touch on her shoulder made her jump. Hi. She turned to see Chase standing behind her. She dropped her smile. I'm Chase Andrews. His eyes, ice pack blue, pierced her own. He seemed completely comfortable to stare into her. She said nothing but shifted her weight. I've seen you around some, you know, over the years in the marsh. What's your name? For a moment he thought she wasn't going to speak. Maybe she was dumb or spoke some primal language, like some said. A less self-assured man might have walked away. Kaya. Obviously, he didn't remember their sidewalk bicycle encounter or know her in any way except as the marsh girl. Kaya. That's different, but nice. You want to go for a picnic in my boat this Sunday? She looked past him taking time to evaluate his words, but couldn't, seem to, couldn't see them to an end. Here was a chance to be with someone. Finally, she said, Okay. He told her to meet him at the Oak Peninsula north of Point Beach at noon. Then he stepped into his blue and white ski boat, metal bits gleaming from every possible surface, and accelerated away. She turned at the sound of more footsteps. Jumpin scurried up the dock. Hi, Miss Kaya. Sorry, I've been toting empty crates out over yonder. Fill her up? Kaya nodded. On the way home, she cut the motor and drifted, the shore in sight. Leaning against the old knapsack, watching the sky, she recited poetry by heart, as she, st as she did sometimes. One of her favourites was John Macefield's Sea Fever. All I ask is a windy day with the white clouds flying and the, fu and the flung spray and the blown spume and the seagulls crying. Kaya recalled a poem written by a lesser known poet, Amanda Hamilton, published recently in the local newspaper she'd bought at the Piggly Wiggly. Trapped inside, love is a caged beast, 
eating its own flesh. Love must be set free to wander, to land upon its chosen shore, and breathe. The words made her think of Tate, and her breathing stopped. All he needed was to find something better and he was gone. Didn't even come to say goodbye. Kaya didn't know, but Tate had come back to see her. The day before he was to bus home for the 4th of July, Dr Blum, the professor who'd hired him, walked into the protozoology lab and asked Tate if he'd like to join a group of renowned ecologists for a birding expedition over the weekend. I've noticed your interest in ornithology and wondered if you'd like to come. I only have room for one student and I thought of you. Yes, absolutely. I'll be there. After Dr Blum left, Tate stood there alone, amid lab tables, microscopes, and the hum of the autoclave, wondering how he'd folded so fast. How quickly he'd jumped to impress his professor, the pride of being singled out, the only student invited. His next chance to go home, and only for one night, had been fifteen days later. He was frantic to apologise to Kaya, who would understand after she learnt of Dr Blum's invitation. He'd cut throttle as he left the sea and turned into the channel, whose log, where logs were lined with the glistening backs of sunbathing turtles. Almost halfway, he spotted her boat carefully hidden in the tall cord grass. Instantly he slowed and saw her up ahead, kneeling on a wide sandbar, apparently fascinated by some small crustacean. Her head low to the ground, she hadn't seen him or heard his slow-moving boat. He quietly turned his skiff into the reeds out of view. He'd known for years that she sometimes spied on him, peeping through needle brush. On impulse, he would do the same. Barefoot, dressed in cut-off jeans and a white t-shirt, she stood up, stretching her arms high, showcasing her wasp-thin waist. She knelt again and scooped sand in her hands, sifting it through her fingers, examining organisms left squiggling in her palm. He smiled at the young biologist absorbed, oblivious. He imagined her standing at the back of the birding group, trying not to be noticed but being the first to spot and identify every bird. Shyly and softly, she would have listened to the precise species of grasses woven into each nest, or the age in days of a female fledgling, based on the emerging colours of her wingtips. Exquisite minutiae, beyond any guidebook or knowledge of the esteemed ecology group, the smallest specifics on which a species spins, the essence. Suddenly, Tate startled as Kaya sprang to her feet, sand spilling from her fingers and looked upstream, away from Tate. He could barely hear the low churn of an outboard motor coming their way, probably a fisherman or marsh dweller headed to town. A purring sound, common and calm as doves. But Kaya grabbed the knapsack, sprinted across the sandbar and scrambled into tall grass. Squatting low to the ground and snatching glances to see if the boat had come into view, she duck-walked toward her boat. Knees lifting nearly to her chin, she was closer to Tate now and he saw her eyes, dark and crazed. When she reached her boat, she hunkered beside its girth, head low. The fisherman, a merry-faced, hatted old man, puttered into view, saw neither Kaya nor Tate, and disappeared beyond the bend. But she remained frozen, listening until the motor whined away, then stood, dabbing her brow. Continued to look in the direction of the boat as a deer, eye, as a deer eyes the empty brush of a departed panther. On some level, he knew she behaved this way. But since the feather game, he had not witnessed the raw, unpeeled core. How tormented, isolated, and strange. He'd been at college less than two months, but had already stepped directly into the world he wanted, analysing the stunning symmetry of the DNA molecule, as if he'd crawled inside a glistening cathedral of coiling atoms and climbed the winding, acidic runs of the helix. 
seeing that all life depends on this precise and intricate code transcribed on fragile organic slivers which would perish instantly in a slightly warmer or colder world. At last, surrounded by enormous questions and people as curious as he to find the answers drawing him forward toward his goal of research biologist in his own lab, interacting with other scientists. Kaya's mind could easily live there, but she could not. Breathing hard, he stared at his decision hiding there in the cord grass. Kaya or everything else? Kaya, I just can't do this, he whispered. I'm sorry. After she moved away, he got into his boat and motored back toward the ocean, swearing at the coward inside who would not tell her goodbye. Chapter 23 The Shell 1965 The night after seeing Chase Andrews on Jumpin's Wharf, Kaya sat at her kitchen table in the easy flicker of lantern light. She'd started cooking again, and she nibbled on a supper of buttermilk biscuits, turnips and pinto beans, reading while she ate. But thoughts of a picnic date with Chase the next day unravelled every sentence. Kaya stood and walked into the night, into the creamy light of a three-quarter moon, The the marsh's soft air fell silk-like around her shoulders. The moonlight chose an unexpected path through the pines, laying shadows about in rhymes. She strolled like a sleepwalker as the moon pulled herself naked from the waters and climbed limb by limb through the oaks. The slick mud of the lagoon shore glowed in the intense light and hundreds of fireflies dotted the woods. Wearing a second-hand white dress with a flowing skirt and waving her arms slowly about, Kaya waltzed to the music of the catydids and leopard frogs. She slid her hands along her sides and up her neck, then moved them along her thighs as she held Chase Andrew's face in her eyes. She wanted him to touch her this way. Her breathing deepened. No one ever looked at her as he did. Not even Tate. She danced among the pale wings of mayflies, fluttering above the bright moon mud. The next morning, she rounded the peninsula and saw Chase in his boat just offshore. Here in daylight, reality drifted ahead, waiting and her boat and her throat dried. Steering into the beach, she stepped out and pulled her boat in, the hull crunching against the sand. Chase drifted up alongside. Hi. Looking over her shoulder, she nodded. He stepped out of his boat and held out his hand to her, long tanned fingers, an open palm. She hesitated. Touching someone meant giving part of herself away, a piece she never got back. Even so, she placed her hand lightly in his. He steadied her as she stepped into the stern and sat on the cushioned bench. A warm, fine day beamed down, and Kaya, wearing denim cut-offs and a white cotton blouse, an outfit she'd copied from the others, looked normal. He sat next to her, and she felt his sleeve slide gently across her arm. Chase eased the boat toward the ocean. The open water tossed the boat more than the quiet marsh, and she knew the pitching motion of the sea would brush her arm against his. That anticipation of touch kept her eyes straight ahead, but she did not move away. Finally, a larger wave rose and dipped, and his arm, solid and warm, caressed hers, jarring away, then touching again with every rise and drop, and then a swell surged beneath them. His thigh brushed against hers, and her breathing stopped. As they headed south along the coast, there's the only boat in this remoteness, he accelerated. Ten minutes on, several miles of white beach stretched along the tide line, protected from the rest of the world by a rounded, thick forest. Up ahead, Point Beach unfolded into the water like a brilliant white fan. Chase had not said a word since his greeting. She had not spoken at all. 
He glided the boat onto shore and tucked the, bis- the picnic basket into the boat's shadow on the sand. Want to walk? he asked. Yes. They strolled along the water, each small wave rushing their ankles into little eddies and then sucking at their feet as, if he- as it was pulled back into the sea. He didn't hold her hand, but now and then in natural movement their fingers brushed. Occasionally, he knelt to examine a shell or a strand of transparent seaweed spiralled into art. Chase's blue eyes were playful. He smiled easily. His skin was dark tan like hers. Together, they were tall, elegant, similar. Kaya knew Chase had chosen not to go to college, but to work for his dad. He was a standout in town, the Tom Turkey, and somewhere within, she worried... She was also a piece of beach art, a, curious to, a curiosity to be turned over in his hands, then tossed back on the sand. But she walked on. She'd given love a chance. Now she wanted simply to fill the empty spaces, ease the loneliness while walling off her heart. After a half mile, he faced her and bowed low, sweeping his arm in an exaggerated invitation for them to sit on the sand against a driftwood log. They dug their feet into the white crystals and leaned back. From his pocket, Chase pulled out a harmonica. Oh, she said. You play? The words felt rough on her tongue. Not very good. Closing his eyes, he played, his his palm fluttering on the instrument like a bird trapped against glass. It was a lovely, plaintive sound like a note from a faraway home. Then, abruptly, he stopped mid-song, picked up a shell slightly larger than a nickel, creamy white with bright splotches of red and purple. Hey, look at this, he said. Oh, it's an ornate scallop, pecten ornatus, Kaya said. I only see them rarely. There are many of them of that genus here, but this particular species usually inhabits regions south of this latitude um, because these waters are too cool for them. He stared at her. Of all the gossip, no one ever mentioned that the marsh girl, the girl who couldn't spell dog, knew the Latin names of shells, where they occurred, and why. I don't know about that, he said, but look here, it's twisted. The little wings flaring on either side of the hinge were crooked, and there was a perfect little hole at the base. He turned it over in his palm. Here, you keep it. You're the shell girl. Thanks. She slid it into her pocket. He played a few more songs, ending with a stampede of Dixie, and then they walked back to the wicker picnic basket and sat on a plaid blanket, eating cold fried chicken, salt-cured ham and biscuits and potato salad. Sweet and dill pickles, slices of four-layer cake with half-inch half thick caramel icing, all homemade wrapped in wax paper. He opened two bottles of Royal Crown Cola and poured them into Dixie cups, her first drink of soda pop in her life. The generous spread was incredible to her, with the neatly arranged cloth napkins, plastic plates and forks, every minuscule pewter salt, even minuscule pewter salt and pepper shakers. His mother must have packed it, she thought, not knowing he was meeting the marsh girl. They talked softly of sea things, pelicans gliding and sandpipers prancing, no touching, little laughing. As Kaya pointed out a jagged cord of pelicans, he nodded and manoeuvred closer to her, so their shoulders brushed slightly. When she looked at him, he lifted her chin with his hand and kissed her. He touched her neck lightly, then feathered his fingers over her blouse towards her breast. Kissing and holding her more firmly now, he leaned back until they were lying on the blanket. Slowly he moved her he moved until he was on top of her, pushing his groin between her legs, and in one movement pulled up her blouse. 
She jerked her head away and squirmed out from under him, her blacker-than-night eyes blazing, tugged her top down. Easy, easy, it's okay. She lay there, hair strewn across the sand, face flushed, red mouth slightly parted. Stunning. Carefully, he reached up and touched her face, but fast as a cat, she sprang away and stood. Kaya breathed hard. Last night, dancing alone on the lagoon shore, swaying about with the moon and the mayflies, she imagined she was ready. Thought she knew all about mating from watching doves. No one ever told her about sex, and her only experience with foreplay had been with Tate. But she knew the details from her biology books, and had seen more creatures copulating, and it wasn't merely rubbing their bottoms together like Jody had said, than most people ever would. But this was too abrupt. Picnic, then mate the marsh girl. Even male birds woo the females for a while. Flashing brilliant feathers, building boas, staging magnificent dances and love songs. Yes, Chase had laid out a banquet, but she was worth more than fried chicken, and Dixie didn't count as a love song. She should have known it would be like this. Only time male mammals hover is when they're in the rut. The silence grew as they stared at each other, broken only by the sound of their breathing and the breakers beyond. Chase sat up and reached for her arm, but she jerked it away. I'm sorry, it's okay, he said as he stood. True, he'd come here to snag her, to be the first, but watching those eyes firing, he was entranced. He tried again. Come on, Kaya, I said I'm sorry. Let's just forget it. I'll take you back to your boat. At that, she turned and walked across the sand toward the woods, her long body swaying. What are you doing? You can't walk back from here, it's miles. But she was already in the trees and ran a crow route first inland, then across the peninsula toward her boat. The area was new to her, but blackbirds guided her across the inland marsh. She didn't slow for bogs or gullies, gullies, splashed right through creeks, jumped logs. Finally, she bent over, heaving, fell to her knees, cussing worn-out words. As long as she ranted, sobs couldn't surface, but nothing could stop the burning shame and sharp sadness. A simple hope of being with someone, of actually being wanted, of being touched, had drawn her in. But these hurried, groping hands were only a taking, not a sharing or giving. She listened for sounds of him coming after her, not sure whether she wanted him to break through the br- break through the brush and hold her, begging for forgiveness or not. Raging again at that, then spent, she stood and walked the rest of the way to her boat. Chapter Twenty Four. The Fire Tower, 1965 Thunderheads piled and pushed against the horizon as Kaya motored into the afternoon sea. She hadn't seen Chase since their beach picnic ten days ago, but still felt the shame and firmness of his body pinning hers against the sand. No other boats were in sight as she steered toward an inlet south of Point Beach, where she had once seen unusual butterflies so powerfully white they might have been albino. But forty yards out, she suddenly released the throttle when she saw Chase's friends packing picnic baskets and bright towels into their boats. Kaya turned quickly to speed away, but, against a strong pull, turned back and searched for him. She knew that no part of this yearning made sense. A logical behaviour to fill an emptiness would not fulfil much more. How much do you trade to defeat some loneliness? And there, near the spot where he kissed her, she saw him walking with fishing rods toward his boat. Behind him, always wears pearls, carried a cooler. Suddenly, Chase turned his head and looked directly at her drifting in her boat. She didn't turn away but stared back at him. As always, shyness won, so she broke eye contact sped off and steered into a shadowy cove. 
She'd wait until the little navy left before going to the beach herself. Ten minutes later, she motored back to the sea and to the sea and up ahead saw Chase alone in his boat, bobbing waves, waiting. The old longing swelled. He was still interested in her. True, he'd come on too strong at the picnic, but he'd stopped when she brushed him away, had apologised. Perhaps she should give him another chance. He motioned over to her and called, Hi, Kaya. She didn't go toward him, but not away either. He motored closer. Kaya, I'm sorry about the other day. Come on, I want to show you the fire tower. She said nothing, still drifting his way, knowing it was weakness. Look, if you've never climbed the tower, it's a great way to see the marsh. Follow me. She increased throttle and turned her boat toward his, all the while scanning the sea to make sure his friends were out of sight. Chase motioned her north past Barclay Cove, the village serene and colourful in the distance, and landed on the beach of a small bay tucked in the deep forest. After securing the boats, he led her down an overgrown path of wax myrtle and prickly holly. She'd never been to this watery and rooty forest, because it seemed on the other side of the village and was too close to people. As they walked, thin runnels of backwater seeped under the brush, slinky reminders that the sea owned this land. Then a true swamp settled deep in the low earthy in the low earth smell and fusty air, sudden, subtle and silent all at once. It stretched into the mouth of the dark receding forest. Kaya saw the weathered wooden platform of the abandoned fire tower above the canopy, and a few minutes later they arrived at its straddled leg base made of rough cut poles. Black mud oozed around the legs and under the tower, and damp rot ate its, ate its way along the beams. Stairs switched to the top, the structure narrowing at each level. After crossing the sludge, they started the climb, chase leading. By the fifth switchback, the rounded oak forests tumbled west as far as they could see. In every other direction, slipstreams, lagoons, creeks and estuaries wove through brilliant green grass to the sea. Kaya had never been this high above the marsh. Now all the pieces lay beneath her, and she saw her friend's full face for the first time. When they reached the last step, Chase pushed open the iron grate covering the stairwell. After they climbed into the platform, he eased it down again. Before stepping on it, Kaya tested it by tapping it with her toes. Chase laughed lightly. It's fine. Don't worry. He led her to the railing, where they looked over the marshland. Two red-tailed hawks, the wind whistling through their wings, soared by at eye level, their eyes cocked in surprise to see a young man and woman standing in their airspace. Chase turned to her and said, Thanks for coming, Kaya, for giving me another chance to say I'm sorry about the other day. I was way out of line and it won't happen again. She said nothing. Parts of her wanted to kiss him now, to feel his strength against her. Reaching into her jeans pocket, she said, I made you a necklace with the shell you found. You don't have to wear it if you don't want to. She'd strung the shell on rawhide the night before, thinking to herself she would wear it, but knowing all along she hoped to see Chase again and would give it to him if she had the chance. But even her wistful daydream had not envisioned them standing together on top of the fire tower, overlooking the world. A summit. Thank you, Kaya, he said. He looked at it and then put it on o over his head, fingering the shell as it rested against his throat. Of course I'll wear it. He said nothing trite like, I'll wear it forever, till the day I die. Take me to your house, Chase said. Kaya imagined the shack hunkered under oaks, 
its grey board its grey board stained with blood from the rusting roof, the screens more holes than mesh, a place of patches. It's far, is all she said. Kaya, I don't care how far or what it's like. Come on, let's go. This chance of acceptance might go away if she said no. All right. They climbed down the tower, and he led her back to the bay, motioning for her to lead the way in her boat. She cruised south to, a, to the maze of estuaries and ducked her head as she slipped into her channel, overhung with green. His boat was almost too big to fit in the jungle overgrowth. Certainly too blue and white, but it squeezed through, limbs screeching along the hull. When her lagoon opened before them, the delicate details of every mossy branch and brilliant leaf reflected in the clear dark water. Dragonflies and snowy egrets lifted briefly as the strain- at his strange boat, then resettled gracefully on silent wings. Kaya tied up as Chase motored up to the shore. The great blue heron, having long ago accepted those less wild, stood stalk still only feet away. Her laundry of faded overalls and t-shirts hung tatty on the line, and so many turnips had spread into the forests, it was difficult to tell where the garden ended and the wilderness began. Looking at the patched porch screen, he asked, "'How long have you lived out here by yourself?' I don't know exactly when Pa left, but about ten years, I think. That's neat, living out here with no parents to tell you what to do. Kai didn't respond except to say, There's nothing to see inside. But he was already walking up the brick and board steps. The first things he saw were her collections lining homemade shelves, a collage of shimmering life just beyond the screen. You did all this? He said. Yes. He looked at some butterflies briefly, but quickly lost interest. Her little mattress on the porch floor had a cover as worn as an old bathrobe, but it was made up neat. A few steps took them through the tiny sitting room, with its sagging sofa, and then he peeped into the back bedroom, where feathers in every colour, shape and size winged the walls. She motioned him into the kitchen, wondering what she could offer him. For sure she had no Coca-Cola or iced tea, no cookies or even cold biscuits. The leftover cornbread sat on the stove top next to a pot of black-eyed peas, shelled and ready to boil for supper. Not one thing for a guest. Out of habit, she stuck a few pieces of wood into the stove into the stove's firebox, stoking it just so with the poker. Flames jumping too instantly. That's it, she said, keeping her back to him, as she pumped the hand crank and filled the dented in kettle. A picture of the 1920s popped up here in the 1960s. No running water, no electricity, no bathroom. The tin bathtub, its rim bent and rusted, stood in the corner of the kitchen. The standalone pie chest held leftovers covered neatly with, ta- with tea towels and the humped refrigerator gaped open, a fly swatter in its mouth. Chase had never seen anything like it. He cranked the pump, watched the water come out into the enamel basin that served as the sink, touched the wood stacked neatly against the stove. The only lights were a few kerosene lanterns. Their chimneys smoked grey. Chase was her first visitor since Tate, who had seemed as natural and accepting as other marsh creatures. With Chase, she felt exposed, as if someone were filleting her like a fish. Shame welled up inside. She kept her back to him, but felt him move around the room, followed by the familiar creaks of the floor. Then he came up behind her, turned her gently, and embraced her lightly. He put his lips against her hair, and she could feel his breath near near her ear. Kaya, nobody I know could have lived out here alone like this. Most kids, even the guys, would have been too scared. She thought he was going to kiss her, but he dropped his arms and walked to the table. What do you want with me? She asked. Tell me the truth. Look, 
I'm not gonna lie. You're gorgeous, free, wild as a dang as a dang gale. The other day, I wanted to get as close to you as I could. Who wouldn't? But that ain't right. I shouldn't have come on like that. I just want to be with you, okay? Get to know each other. Then what? Well, we'll just find out how we feel. I won't do anything unless you want me to. How's that? That's fine. You said you had a beach. Let's go to the beach. She cut off pieces of the leftover cornbread for the gulls and walked ahead of him down the path until it opened wide to the bright sand and sea. She let out her soft cry and the gulls appeared and circled around her shoulders. The large male, Big Red, landed and walked back and forth across her feet. Chase stood a little distance away, watching as Kaya disappeared into the spiralling birds. He hadn't planned on feeling anything for this strange and feral barefoot girl, but watching her swirl across the sand, birds at her fingertips, he was intrigued by, the, by her self-reliance as well as her beauty. He'd never known anyone like Kaya. A curiosity as well as, as well as desire stirred in him. When she came back to where he stood, he asked her if he could come again the next day promised he would not even hold her hand, that he just wanted to be near her. She simply nodded, the first hope in her heart since Tate left.